Hello everyone and welcome to Sinderful Gaming. I hope you're all doing well, I hope you're all staying safe, and most of all, I hope you're all fighting that war against the grey. Today's video, we're going to go through a brief a little explanation of every Warhammer Age of Sigma army and their place within the narrative of Warhammer Age of Sigma to give you an idea of what they are all about. Without further ado, we've got a lot of armies to get through, so let's get cracking on. Let's chat a little bit about every army and let us know what your favourite thing is about your favourite army in the game down below. And so, Beasts of Chaos. These are the true children of Chaos. So, unlike a lot of the other worshippers of Chaos we have throughout the mortal realms, you know, you've got things like your Blades of Corn, your Disciples of Zinch, all of these are humans that have generally fallen to the corruption of Chaos. Beastmen, rather, are a much more truer embodiment of Chaos. Generally, they have been in the mortal realms for a long, long time. We have creatures that have potentially fallen to them from various older races. We look at things like the Dragon Ogres, who are actually creatures from Azir that were pushed out by Sigma in the time of the Age of Myth. Uh, and have now sort of fallen to chaos and creatures like that. We've then got other creatures like the Ungor and the Bestigor and all the Brayherd sort of stuff, which are either just mutated beasts of the wild or in some things called a Turnskin, which is actually where a beastman has been born to two human or two mortal parents. Uh, and generally these Turnskins are quite nasty and we've read stories of the Turnskins actually eating their own parents. Um, but all in all, these beastmen uh, can come in a variety of different things. They're generally lots of chaos-corrupted creatures. Uh, and indeed, the monsters of chaos are generally quite corrupted versions of many different things. We've got, obviously, giant corrupted creatures like the Saigor, the Jabba Sly, which is an absolutely horrifying creature. And we've got other amazing, like, weird and wondrous creatures, things like the Cockatrice uh, and the Gorgon and all of these weird creatures. The Beastmen want nothing more than to see the mortal realms plunged back into, I guess, the wildlands that they love, uh, that they sort of hunt and feed in. Uh, they see the civilizations of the other races as something that has defiled the natural order of their corrupted sort of way of thinking what the realms should be. And so they want nothing more than to tear down the walls of civilization and slaughter its people, uh, seeing their domain over the realms once again become true and whole. The Blades of Corn. Now, Blades of Corn are the worshippers of the blood god Corn. He is a ruthless god who, one of the gods we've really got a really decent look at, he sits upon this mighty throne of skulls, and the skulls are offered to him as, I guess, this some sort of a tribute to the mighty Lord of Skulls himself to try and earn favour. Corn is a merciless god. He really doesn't care where the blood flows from, whether it's from his enemies or indeed his own followers. Uh, his warriors march across the realms in seek of slaughter and martial conquest. Um, and they really are quite nasty. You've got these hordes of feral tribesmen uh, like the Blood Reavers that just wander around and many of them are cannibalistic uh, as well that just sort of wander the mortal realms terrorizing the people of Order and indeed the other races. Uh, Korn generally has his home sought out, or rather his warriors have their home sought out in the realm of actually the realm of Fire Chump. Uh, and so it is with this that his warriors just march across. They were the first sort of armies encountered by Sigmar when Sigmar launched his first strike with Vander's Hammerhand and the Stormcast Eternals. It was against the realm of Akshi and right into the depths of the realm of Korn at the time. Korn's armies, while they have all these mighty mortal, are sort of joined by these mighty demons known as Blood Letters and Blood Thirsters, living embodiments of the hatred, the battle fury, and the need for slaughter that Korn has. It is these creatures that sort of Korn has an affinity with, and many of them actually seek to maybe even try and usurp, and some have things like Scarbrand have actually tried to usurp Korn and did nothing but a chink in the blood god's armor and almost thrown helted across the realms uh, to see his wings shredded. A really cool army. This army just likes to do what it does best and go in and get the fighting done nice and close. The Disciples of Zinch. 
Zinc is the chaos god of fate, magic, and trickery. Uh, his followers, as such, are pretty much consumed with those sort of things. Generally, their armies are led by these mighty sorcerous chaos warriors uh, who can unleash vast different uh, magical powers upon their enemies, whether that be mighty flames or indeed imbuing their own followers with mighty powers that uh, could otherwise consume them. Zinch loves to sort of work around this entirely super duper complex plan uh, where he, I guess himself, doesn't even really understand what the actual end game is. It's just a bunch of schemes upon schemes upon schemes upon even more schemes just to sort of intertwining and all leading to these eventual outcomes that maybe have some influence on his, I guess, eventual end game. Zinc has so many different aspects, and the one cool thing I really like is that this is the Chaos Cult that is one of the ones that is rather easy to infiltrate the normal civilizations of the mortal realms. Zinc cults can quite easily sort of live underneath cities, and normal sort of people you would not expect to be actually can be a Zinc cultist, sort of bringing cities down from within uh, and with this sort of corrupt sort of plans that they all have. It's even said that Zinch cultists can live inside Azir, and some, in fact, even do, apparently. You've got these cults within, I guess, the impregnable realm of Sigma in Azir himself in Azerheim. And so this is what really makes Zinch so insidious. They're backed up by mutated uh, creatures called the Zangor, which are either mutated beastmen who worship the god Zinch, uh, or indeed the corrupted and mutated humans who have gone and become turnskins in their own right. The Hedonites of Slanesh. Slanesh is the god of excess and his followers take everything they do to the excess of it all. Whether that be martial combat and becoming the absolute perfect swordsman or the perfect wielder of a spear or indeed something like a kunai and chain or any weapon in Imaginable, the Hedonites of Slanish just love to take these things to excess. They could, for instance, become such glorious poets that their words would simply make a man die of sadness hearing the sorrowful story they could tell in such beauty with their poetry. Not only that, but there are just so many forms of excess, whether you uh, they are excess in their, I guess, tastings of all the flavors of the mortal realms, uh, eating their way across the mortal realms, sampling everything uh, from the finest wines and the finest breads and fruits to even trying the most uh, despicable sort of meats, whether eating human flesh or other things like that. Um, the Hedonites of Slanesh just take everything to excess. And it is with this that the army is sort of formed around this idea of pain and pleasure. Uh, the excess that they can do, eating something so horribly rancid, but it feels so good, the pain that that might cause in your stomach. Or indeed, cutting oneself uh, and flaying their own skin to reveal crude sort of uh, scarification marks and all of that sort of stuff that really just makes them uh, this despicable sort of... Uh, chaos cult that they are. They truly are probably the most despicable of all chaos cults. This uh, way they sort of corrupt themselves is just so despicable to anyone else looking upon the Hing Knights, and especially uh, they are mortal enemies of many of the elven races who see them as just crude creatures. They're backed up by mighty demons of Slanesh that promise all these luxurious promises and, you know, wealth and uh, all these amazing sort of things you can promise someone who wants the finest things in life. The Magikin of Nurgle. Nurgle is the known as the Jolly Grandfather himself, a very joyous sort of chaos god. He blesses his followers with all sorts of diseases uh, that would otherwise kill a faithless man, uh, but instead his followers due to their faith in him, become living hosts of parasites, maggots, and all manner of diseases that would, as said, otherwise kill normal people. Uh, they become bloated and extremely resilient to pain and even death, many of them becoming pretty much immortal uh, thanks to all these gifts. You've got this weird sort of thing where, you know, all the diseases sort of go into one and they sort of 
bring about a life because all these diseases need a living host and so the followers of Nurgle continue to survive because they are living breeding grounds for all these various diseases. Nurgle warriors and Nurgle armies corrupt the land, though, wherever they go, and generally seek out life uh, to corrupt and give, as they like to think of it, immortality. This is why you see so many Nurgle forces in the realm of life, as they think by giving all these diseases and poxes and plagues and everything to the realm of life, it'll give it the immortality and will stop this sort of cycle of life and death that actually happens within the realm of life as, you know, trees grow old and fall over and die. Nurgle go, well, our trees don't die, so let's corrupt everything uh, and it'll all be in this jolly sort of unlife forever that it can be in. Uh, Nurgle himself is absolutely obsessed with Alario, as are many of his followers. They all seem to want to uh, court the lady of life herself, the goddess of the Sylvaneth, um, in some sort of like corrupted manner, and it's it's just really, really um, sort of devolved in how it sort of works between the two. Uh, she obviously wants absolutely nothing to do and despises no in every possible way, uh, but it doesn't stop him from trying to get to his one true love, or at least he thinks it's his one true love. The Skaven, the Ratman of the Mortal Realms. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and their cultures between the clans vary quite wildly. You have the Techno Sorcery of Clan Scryer, uh, you have the Abominations created by Clan Mulder, the Ninja Rats of Clan Eshin, and the Plague Worshipping Disciples of Nurgle. Uh, called Clan Pestilence, and many other clans in between, many warlord clans led by various different warlords across the mortal realms. Skaven are a maniacal bunch. They can never be anyone's true ally, not even their own, as every one of them is constantly scheming to gain the upper hand on all of his rivals. Were Skaven to ever truly unite, they could probably overwhelm the entirety of the mortal realms, but as this need for the to be the one in charge, to be the mightiest of, I guess, these Ratmen that sees them forever not completing their plans of, I guess, greater conquest across the mortal realms. All the different warlords uh, vie for supremacy and backstab and order assassinations upon their fellow rivals, uh, all the while forgetting that maybe they're in an actual battle against someone else while trying to kill their rivals. It's not uncommon for a Skaven Warlord to backstab his general in the middle of an actual war against someone else and then go, yay, I'm the leader now, and all of a sudden get backstabbed himself by someone else and then the Skaven lose because, well, they ended up killing all their generals on the battlefield and now a clan rat is in charge of the host uh, and he quickly gets eaten by a rat ogre. Um, Skaven are just so much uh, fun as an army. They've got so many different parts, moving parts to the force, uh, and they've just got such a unique sort of way of how their culture works. They are truly fearful and can actually uh, put out a scent of fear. And many of them are just so scared and so paranoid of absolutely everything in the mortal realms. The Slaves to Darkness. The, I guess, um, normal sort of followers in the mortal realms of Chaos. They are not as entirely devoted to the singular Chaos Gods like other things like the Hidden Knights, the Slanish, and stuff like that. And many of them, in fact, are the direct warriors of the Lord of the End Times, the Ever-Chosen himself, Archaon. Uh, whether this be his Vanguard or his legions of Chaos Warriors and Chaos Knights. Uh, the Slaves to Darkness generally are the most numerous of all the Chaos cults across the mortal realms making up their number with various different tribes of savages uh, from across the mortal realms like the untamed beasts or the flayed uh, and also having just generally lots of barbarian tribes of marauders mixed in and dark oath savages then you have the chaos warriors who are mighty uh, heroes in their own right or i guess heroes isn't the right word mighty Unheroes maybe is a little bit better way to describe them, but they are mighty warriors encased wholly within their armor that can never truly come off as they're sort of fused into that armor. Uh, it's fused to their skin. And Archaon then leads his mighty vanguard, his generals across the battlefield. Uh, these even mighty chaos warriors that are one in uh, one million or something crazy like that as they slaughter their way. Chaos lords slaughter their way to become a vanguard warrior. 
Truly one of the most fearsome armies to see on the tabletop. If a horde of Chaos Warriors led by Arkhaon is coming for your city, you haven't got really much of a hope in anything to survive the onslaught that is about to come your way. Moving on to death, the Flesh Eater Courts are deluded cannibalistic monstrosities that stalk the dark and deadly places of the mortal realms. On the outside, what we see them as are these monstrous hideous ghouls that feast on the flesh uh, of living creatures, but really what they see themselves as are in fact noble knights in their grand delusion. Um, they see themselves as these uh, true depictions of nobility and these mighty heroes that are saving the mortal realms. Where we see a bunch of crypt ghouls, uh, they see a bunch of men at arms loyally following their lord to battle. Where we see a mighty uh, ghoul king riding a terrorgeist, they instead see a regal and noble lord, a knight lord, riding a mighty hippogriff or indeed a pegasus. And where we see the Crypt Flayers or the Abhorrent Ghouls, they instead see mighty knights striding to battle atop regal steeds. The Flesh Eater Courts in these grand illusions can see themselves in all manner of different things and truly are just utterly insane. Uh, they don't see themselves in a way uh, that I guess the rest of the realms do, and this leads to them being a massive mercenary force across many of the realms. No true followers of Nagash himself, they actually have been known to fight for cities, uh, thinking they're freeing cities, none more famously than the city of Lethus, valiantly flying down to try and save the city of Lethus, thinking that they are the noble knights sent to protect the mortal realm. And it really does make for one of the coolest stories in all of Age of Sigma, um, I think. They just truly are this really cool force, and it leaves just so many options open on how you want to present this on the tabletop. Uh, but just this utterly insane rabid force that is so deluded is just incredible. The Night Haunt, Nagash's Vanguard Legions. Ghostly apparitions that wander the mortal realms in some cruel sort of punishment of some sort dished out by Nagash who likes to sort of give everyone a punishment due. You have the chain rafts who are forever bound in chains to represent their prisoner status. You have the hunters and the murderers forever given horse skulls as glaive rafe stalkers across the army and many other forms of nighthorn across the army all have this sort of I guess a weird take on what they were in life. These evil souls that Nagash has collected to become his Nighthorn all have this punishment situated upon them to make them sort of remember what it is that they were in their past life. The Nighthorn are led by Lady Alinda, the Mortark of Greece, a sorrowful and powerful character who brings death and despair everywhere she goes. She... Uh, is one of the most powerful Mortarks at the current point in time in the lore of Age of Sigma, as she has taken both the fight and captured the city of Lethus, allowing Catacross the Mortark uh, to be rebuilt and reborn again, and also taking the fight to the eight points as well with her legions of uh, ghostly spirits. The Nighthorn fights a battle like no one else. They're able to overcome sheer defenses as they have no real, uh, I guess, part to play in a Nighthorn assault as they can literally just meld their way through. Cities are required to have magical weapons and required to do much more with their magical defenses when a Nighthorn army is on the horizon that's staring down their city in their path. Ossiarch Bone Reapers. A weird one for a death army, led by the Mortark of the Necropolis, Catacross himself. Uh, the Ossiarch Bone Reapers are effectively the Mortal Realms tax collectors, built by Nagash by the fusing of all manner of different bone magics and bone products together. You get these warriors that are greater than the sum of their parts. A weird mo mocking version of the Stormcast, where the Stormcast are the greatest of souls in single form. The Ossian Bone Reapers, rather, are multiple souls smashed together to make something greater than any one of the singular souls. Many of the Ossian Bone Reapers are mindless creatures, the Mortec Guard, and their linesmen uh, of their force generally are quite, uh, 
normal sort of skeletons, these mindless creatures, but the characters of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, the Leech Cavalos, the Soul Reapers, the Soul Masons, and all of them actually have quite a bit of independent thought, which is quite rare for a Death Army. These are independent thinking generals that Nagash has actually built on the mortal realms. Uh, and, you know, normally his whole thing is he likes subservitude, but many of these actually have their own, I guess, agendas and dreams. And some of them even dream of one day maybe perhaps becoming their own lord within Nagash's kingdom and not wholly uh, subservient to the Lord of Death. The Ossiarch Bone Reapers, as I said, are the tax collectors of the mortal realms. They go around from city to city collecting what's called the Bone Tithe, where they demand that all cities give either a supplement of bone, be that from the dead, be that every citizen giving up a finger to give to the Bone Tithe, or indeed, you know, entire families or entire people being given up to the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. If the Bone Tithe is not met, the Ossiarch Bone Reapers will assault the city and take the Bone Tithe from everyone and everything within the city. Soul Black Grave Lords, vampiric masters ruling over legions of undead soldiers, whether that be skeletons, zombies, creatures of the night like direwolves and felbats, even monsters like terrorgeists and uh, the mighty zombie dragons. The Soul Black Grave Lords uh, like to have their independence. They're creatures that, much like the Ossiarch Bone Reapers don't like Nagash controlling them, and in fact, they are far more independent thinking, though they are utterly scared of Nagash uh, and what he might do to them should they ever, or should he ever realize that their plans are maybe not with his best intentions. Led by countless of the Mortarchs, both Manfred and Neferata, and other major players like Prince Vordurai, uh, their Soul Black Grave Lords are stereotypical undead army. You know, you've got vampires and necromancers and white kings and skeleton champions at the top of the army, and then you've got legions of different creatures. There are vast different arrays of multiple creatures throughout the force, whether you've got things like felbats and direwolves or mighty skeleton warriors like the Graveguard, or you've even got uh, weird and wondrous creatures in there like the Vengorian Lords as well. The Soul Blade Grave Lords are a vast horde of undead that just shambles its way across the mortal realms, killing all in its path that just simply add to the numbers within its own force. Not much can stand up to them, and they have even the most elite of cavalry being the Blood Knights, which are just an entire coven of vampiric knights that just rampage across the battlefield, destroying all in their path. Gloomspite Gits. Hordes of maniac, fungus-infected goblins rampage across the mortal realms at night, following the light of the Bad Moon and their, I guess, idol of worship that floats across the mortal realms, bathing the realms in its cursed light wherever it goes. Gloomspite Gits live in the deep and dark, dank places of the mortal realms. Generally, staying away from the light and not interacting much with the other races unless the bad moon arises in front of them. When the bad moon arises, these goblins become I guess, infused with the energy and power seeing their quote-unquote god-like uh, thing that the moon is to them. Uh, high up in the sky, they become just rabid hordes of goblins, leading out various war beasts like squigs of all sorts of sizes, which are literally uh, mouth and teeth with legs. Uh, and Trogoths join the fight, the giant arachnorock spiders and the Skitterstrand tribes, along with many other types of goblins as well, all come out and just start enveloping the mortal realms in their crazed lunacy uh, that is for the bad moon itself. The Gloomspite Gits have many different wizards who generally like to turn people into mushrooms. None more so than Scragron himself who has an entire mushroom garden where he hears the prophecies of people he's turned into actual living mushrooms down in his little dank hold, which is sort of like a separate realm in itself. Uh, Gl Gloomspite Gits love to just collect bottles as well. It is their currency as they have no idea how to make glass, so they collect bottles. Wherever they go, they will find bottles and collect them and use that as their form of currency across the mortal realms. The Ogamore Tribes. Ogres are these ever-hungry creatures that need to continuously eat, lest they, I guess, uh, begin to eat one another marching their way across the mortal realms, eating absolutely everything in their path. 
There are two types of ogres uh, typically within ogre more tribes. That is the Beast Claw Raiders and the Gut Busters. The Gut Busters are much more um, martial prowess and they are your stereotypical sort of ogres marching across the mortal realms eating absolutely everything in their path whether that be uh, entire civilizations uh, or it happens to be just the beasts of the world around them eating entire forests made out of wood or entire mountains if they get that hungry. They will eat absolutely anything. Uh, you have also the Beast Claw Raiders, who are the ogres that once fought Nagash and freed the gods of winter and are now constantly followed by those same gods of winter from the deep vaults that they freed in Shaiish uh, and now uh, have this sort of frost like appearance to them. The regular ogres, not liking to keep the Beast Claw too much. They are two separate tribes, very much, but they do share a common ancestry between them of the ogres of old. You have other sorts of ogres within the army as well, things like your man-eaters, which are mercenary ogres, and things like your fire bellies, which are shamanistic fire-breathing ogres. The ogres, generally, their physiology, they are about eight feet tall to 10 feet tall to 12, and sometimes even more at 12 feet tall. Generally, large, rotund stomachs house most of their vital organs, which is why they wear the gut plates that they do and are commonly seen wearing. Generally, an ogre will fight with a large weapon, either one-handed or two-handed, and sometimes wield a, a spiked gauntlet as well, known as an iron fist, or which they can use not only to parry like a shield, but also punch back and deal damage to their opponents. The Auric War Clans. Generally, Auric War Clans are made up of three major tribes. These are the Bone Splitters, the Iron Jaws, and the Cruel Boys. We're talking about each one in turn, the Bone Splitters are Feral Orcs. They are essentially the orcs that have become so uh, enamored with a war energy and the thought of their god Gokumoka that they give up all sort of forms of normal civilization, not even crafting armor and weapons, using their base sort of nature of like just giant pieces of sharpened stone attached to wood and even wielding giant pieces of bone from the animals and the monsters that they kill as weapons in battle. They generally are quite shamanistic and quite tribal in how they work. The Oryx of the Iron Jaws, on the other hand, are much more warbred, larger than any of their other Orc cousins. The Iron Jaws rampage to war in giant thick plate armor that they have either stolen or just hammered crudely into shape for themselves. The Iron Jaws love a good fire, and the continuous fighting leads to them getting even bigger and bigger until you get the size of something like a Megaboss, which stands even bigger than most ogres, and can stand right up to the size of many Gargants as well. The Cruel Boys are the last sort of Auric in the Auric War Clans, and while the other two are much more uh, fighty, the Cruel Boys like to use uh, underhanded tactics and perhaps maybe favour Mork a little bit sneaky rather than Gork a little bit fighty. The Cruel Boys like to use traps, they like to use deception, they like to use fear as a weapon in battle, and love to use their poisoned weapons from the bogs on which they came, feeding their mounts and their weirdo like creatures uh, all these poisons so that they can infect and kill their enemies from afar and as painfully as possible. The Sons of Behemoth, the army of entire Gargants. The Sons of Behemoth are the children of the son of the great god beast himself, Yemnog, who then birthed the god beast Behemoth, and these are his mighty children. Behemoth was a god beast that was slain during the Realm Gate Wars, and the Sons of Behemoth have forever not forgiven the Stormcast and the forces of order, or indeed the forces of chaos, for slaying their forefather, the mighty Behemoth. The Sons of Behemoth have answered the call and have started rallying in numbers never before seen across the realms, and now entire tribes of Gargants march to war. Armed with all manner of massive weapons, making use of whatever they can across the mortal realms, the Gargants are utterly destructive and not much can stand in the way of these destructive brutes. Mega Gargants are even more fearsome than your regular Gargan, acting almost two to three to four times the size of your regular Gargan, towering above even the tallest of city walls. These Mega Gargants have now become even more increasingly common across the mortal realms as the Gargants begin to age and begin to grow with, uh, with the ages past and they're just utterly destructive across the mortal realms. 
the cities of Sigmar. So these are the bastions of order set out across the mortal realms and many different races call them home. Whether that's humans, Dwarden, or the many sorts of elves, be that wanderers, darkling covens, scourge privateers, phoenix temple, and many more besides, all call the cities home. The cities are not, while called the cities of Sigmar, not always belonging to Sigmar, or at least he's not the only god or worship within these cities. These are just his or pantheon's cities across the mortal realms. Many other gods have cities that worship them, things like Harkuron and worship Marathi, and you also have many cities within death that worship Nagash as well. And indeed, many other cities throughout have Alariel and Realm of Gyran life, uh, and many more besides. What makes this cool, though, is this is the regular people of the mortal realms. There's not that many... Uh, over-the-top monsters, yes, you've got griffins and demigriffs, but there's nothing more sort of extreme than anything like that or a dragon in the army. There's no weird and wondrous creatures here. This is pretty simple sort of fantasy. Your general humans live within the city, and that's what sort of makes this army what it is. It is the general person fighting across the mortal realms. Um, and so you get this really down-to-earth look of an army that has spearmen, has archers, has crossbows, has handgunners, has cavalry of all sorts, and has, you know, a few little odd bits and pieces, especially bringing in the Dwarden and the Elves, mostly the Elves, but they really do make for a fun and interesting army on the tabletop, a true all-rounder force that, like... It, its sort of city itself and how the city can become better due to all the races working together its armed forces are better when all the city is working together as one the daughters of cain blood worshipping disciples of marathi cain the newly reborn god of murder as she stole the throne from the previous god of cain tricking many of her followers that uh, to in fact bless her with power rather than the god cain she has now usurped that god and now leads these mighty warrior women into battle the daughters of Cain love nothing more than the bloodshed, and even in the cities that they call home, seek out victims to sacrifice to their dark goddess, uh, Marathi herself. Marathi was swallowed by Slanesh at the end of the old world, the end of malice in the end times, and she crawled her way out of Slanesh's mouth, and in doing so, she was utterly corrupted. A serpentine form of herself, and she has taken some of the elf souls that were drawn from the mouth of Slanesha with the help of the other elven gods and crafted them in, her, them in her image. However, like her, they are slightly corrupted. You have the weird harpy-like creatures called the Kinari, and the weird snake-like creatures called the Melusai that make up many of the Daughters of Cain within the ranks of the forces of them. Marathi, as said, has now taken over the mantle of the god Cain. During the Broken Realm saga, she made a daring pact and took over uh, the mantle by going and taking some of the souls directly from Slanesh, imbuing herself with mighty magical energy. But she was split asunder in two, and now she is two separate creatures leading the daughters of Cain into battle as both Marathi Cain and the Shadow Queen. The Fire Slayers. Fire Slayers are a bunch of mountain dwelling Dwarden, normally mountain dwelling. There are stories of other ones living inside giant tree or mines and other things like that, but normally mountain dwelling. Uh, the Fire Slayers are the disciples of the Dwarven Slayer God Grimir. The Slayer God was destroyed in the Age of Myth, fighting the mighty beast Volcatrix, the mother of all salamanders and the mother of all the magma drops. And during this fight, he was shattered into a million pieces into what is now known as Urgold. The Fire Slayers are absolutely obsessed with Urgold and will do absolutely anything to obtain it, even fighting for and alongside the forces of chaos, death and destruction for Urgold. When they get the Urgold, they imbue it into their very flesh, giving them supernatural powers and a mighty strength beyond the normal sort of stature of what a mighty Dwarden can do already when he hones his skills for thousands of years. The Fire Slayers live in lodges deep underneath mountains where they keep their master runes safe. Uh, the master runes being these absolutely super powerful runes that runesmiths and rune smiters have crafted over countless generations and honed into these ultra powerful arcane artifacts. 
the might of the fire slayers is true when they start riding the magma drops the mightiest of the rune fathers rune sons and rune smiters uh, can uh, tame these mighty beasts and have them fight for them these living embodiments of salamanders and the living embodiments of volcatrix just as the fire slayers are the living embodiment of grimmy fight alongside in mutual harmony to destroy the enemies of chaos the Ardenef Deepkin, deep sea living underwater elves who have the, I guess, terrible fortune that 99 out of 100 of all of their children are born without proper souls. Whether that be a sort of uh, mount form souls or no soul at all, their children just wither and die. And it is because of this, the noble race that is the elves that are the INF Deepkin have to do something absolutely evil in order to keep their race alive. They must go and take the souls of the living in order to keep their own children from dying and their entire species from dying out. Teclas created the INF Deepkin before he created any other elves in the mortal realms. And it was the INF Deepkin that suffered because of this by being the very first creatures and elves created by one of the elven gods from the souls that escaped the clutches of Selanesh, the Idenef Deepkin were the most cursed souls of all. The process of creating the elves and tact was not as perfect as it is now refined in many of the other creatures and other elves that came later. So these poor souls now have to do what is necessary for their entire species to survive. At one point, Teclas realized his mistake and did try to destroy the Ardenef Deepkin. And it was at this point that the army and the race decided to go unhide underwater in the deepest recesses, far away from the prying eyes of the mortal realms, gods, and other things besides. Caradron Overlords. These Skyfaring Dwarden, when the Chaos forces came to overtake the realms and ended the Age of Myth and brought upon the time of Chaos. You had things like the Fire Slayers who stayed and fought. You had the Dispossessed who ran back to his ear. The Caradron Overlords flew up into the sky and took off in these giant airships and air cities in order to evade the forces of Chaos. The Caradron Overlords now have a true sort of culture all of their own, completely separate. While they know the gods exist, they really don't like them and don't want anything to do with the gods. Instead, making their own luck for themselves and investing heavily in their skyports, seeking plunder and treasure to further guarantee their wealth and their power within the mortal realms. The Caradron Overlords are vastly advanced, using a magical substance known as Aether Gold, a lighter-than-air gold that's literally liquid magic, though the Caradron Overlords won't tell you that. The Caradron Overlords generally use this to power all manner of machinery, from their airships to their sky cities, to all manner of different weaponry, from entire power armor suits to some of their more ostentatious and inventive gun weaponry. The Caradron Overlords are always looking to make a deal and looking to make a bargain. They will do whatever it can and they put all sorts of clauses into their contracts with people saying, well, if I, lo if this person, if you lose an arm and can no longer take part in the fighting, then you will not get a cut of the share of the spoils. If you happen to lose your gun, you will have to pay recompense out of that. It is all of this stuff that makes Caradron Overlords expert businessmen as much as expert skyfarers and masters masters of war. The Lumineth Realm Lords. The Lumineth are Teclas's perfect project of elves. Created after the Iron Nef Deepkin, Teclas learned from his mistakes and forged an army in his own image. However, like their Iron Nef cousins, they were eventually found to have a fatal flaw and that was their own pride. And this led to their downfall and the Spirefall, a calamitous era of the Lumineth Realm Lords history where they literally fought amongst themselves, birthing many depraved cults within their ranks and within their mortal realms and eventually almost bring their entire civilization down upon itself. Were it not for Teclas going and seeking out the great beast Selena, the true moon, uh, and then learning the magical powers of the four aspects of Hayish, be that zenith, mountain, air, or river, 
and then teaching these to the Lumineth, they would otherwise have completely and utterly destroyed themselves. And so now the Lumineth use these four aspects of the realm to teach themselves and to better hone their skills in a particular fashion and learn to live in harmony with the realm and within themselves as well. When the Lumineth go to war, it is with vast ranks of Venari troops at its core, the vast general populace, the I guess normal sort of militia force of the Lumineth Realm Lords race, backed up by the amazing different temples of the different cults that follow all of the different aspects of Hayish, be that zenith, mountain, river, or earth. The Seraphon, masters of the celestial realm. The Seraphon are led by creatures known as the Slan Mage Priests. These all powerful wizards that can literally manipulate the realm and the very cosmos around them. The Slan are the disciples of the Old Ones, vast ancient beings that once built the world of the Old World called Malice. The Slan now continuously work to further the plan of the Old Ones, seeing everything and knowing the ultimate plan of those forefathers of the Old Ones and what it was hoping to achieve. The Seraphon are the creatures that fall underneath the Slan, the various different Saurus, Warriors, Skinks and all manner of other creatures that fall under that race. The Seraphon now are split between two types of beings, the Starborn, who are Seraphon that live in these vast spaceships up high above the mortal realms, drifting between the space between realms and coming down upon starlight creatures, sort of dreamed up into reality by the very slan. However, over time, many of those creatures dreamt up by the visions of the slan have started to gain their own sentience and become true forms this has created the coalesce seraphon who are now actual beings living in the mortal realms and are starting to return to their more tribalistic feral and monstrous ways of their forefathers that lived in the world that was the Stormcast eternals mighty warriors reforged in lightning by sigma helden hammer himself the Stormcast Eternals are warriors that have fought in Sigmar's name across the mortal realms, and some, maybe who haven't, uh, taken up by Sigmar upon their very deaths, uh, and their very end, to fight in his brand new armies. They are taken up, their souls hammered and reforged by the Seven Smiths, uh, smacking a part of Sigmar's own power within them to create them into mighty immortal warriors. Stormcast can never truly die when they are killed in battle, they explode in a shower of lightning and then fan up back to the heavens or whence they came. However, there is a problem with that now, as Bellacor's dark curse has blackened the skies and Stormcast are now seeming to be lost, wandering the heavens and wandering the tops of the realms as they try to seek their way past Bellacor's dark cloud. This is where the Thunderstrike Stormcast come into it, a new creation by, St by Sigma and by Grungi. In cooperation, they've created the new Thunderstrike armor, which is able to pierce the heavens and pierce the dark skies Bellacor has created to send the Stormcast back to Azir to be reforged and brought back into the battle once again. Stormcast not only are immortal, but they are the greatest of all warriors. Many of them have fought for countless centuries, and many of them were great champions, kings, lords, heroes of renown, or just valorous men who create, who did one final last deed. Much the same as someone like Vandus Hammerhand, who was just a humble blacksmith who stood against Corgus Cool in his days as a mortal man with nothing but a hammer in hand. The Stormcast Eternals that come down upon lightning and they build and defend the cities of mortal citizens of the mortal realms, smiting Sigmar's enemies with lightning wherever they go. Lastly, we have the Sylvaneth, the tree people of the mortal realms, the embodiment of life itself. The Sylvaneth live in war groves hidden deep within these vast sort of sub pocket realms within the realm of life and across the other realms as well. The Sylvaneth generally take on an aspect of the forest in which they live. You'll find the flamewood tree and living in actually you'll find a dark and mysterious and brooding deadly tree in the realm of Shaish and you'll find misty tree shades in the realm of Ogu. The Sylvaneth are the herders of forests. Wherever they go, they sprout forests relating to the types of trees that they are everywhere across the battlefield. 
All of them follow the goddess Alariel, though some of them also worship the god uh, consort of Alariel, Kurnoth, in all his hunter's might. The Sylvaneth love to fight war as a sort of guerrilla warfare style, hitting from ambush from the trees before sinking back in and becoming almost impossible to find. The Treemen are governed over by mighty councils of Tree Lord Ancients, giant ant-like creatures that form a sage council that governs everything that they do. There are many different parts of the Sylvaneth, but the most important part of their whole culture is the Soul Pods. Hidden deep within the heart of their very groves, these Soul Pods are the lifeblood of all Sylvaneth. And Sylvaneth can never truly die, for when one dies, his Soul Pod is collected and thus planted to gain and create a yet more Sylvaneth for their forces. Sylvaneth are such an interesting race. They are part fae, part nature, and also part elf as well, as Alariel is their mother, and she has created them in somewhat of the image of what she remembers her people. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you all for watching. Please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, let us know down in the comments below what you enjoyed about it. If you'd like to come chat more with me and other members of our little fine community here at Sinful Gaming, you can do so by joining our Discord server, which is linked down in the video's description. And lastly, if you'd like to help support the channel financially, you can do so by joining either our Patreon or YouTube members. Our YouTube members will get access to some cool little emojis you can use during live streams and also to comment on some of our posts and on our videos with, and you'll get your name with a special little icon on it as well on YouTube. Our Patreons and YouTube members will also get a name up in a special colour in our Discord server as well. And finally, you'll get a shout out from us as well on Patreon or YouTube members at the end of every video that you have helped support. Thank you to our Patreons, Christian Weir, James Soren, Greenskins Gaming, AJC, Kenny Lowell, Outer and Shop First, Andrew Bowen, Nathan Fee, The Rising 8, Cure Dynamic, Agu, Anthony B, Anton Nielsen, JJ Austrian, Average Wargamer, Domir, Mark Harvey, and James Cater. And a special thanks to our YouTube members, Green Roots Gaming, Kenton Young, Chris Wallace, Ronya, Vinny, Locklorick, The Johnny 84, David Ellsworth, Revenar, Wolfric Nick, Broken Shelf, Adriana Edwards, and Sean Scott. And a special thanks to, first of all, Lady Witchfox Art, who does all the amazing artwork you can see pictured here for the channel, and to Xmorphic, who does all the amazing background work for the channel. And that's it from us today. Please don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and comment down on the video below. Stay safe, everyone. Stay well, and most of all, keep fighting that war against the Grey. Ciao for now.